Okay, we have another guy that if I've got my names right, he's really kind of important. Sing Swan. Now, if I've got this straight, and I've been known to make mistakes, uh, but as far as I know, he wrote, and this is the only thing he did of any consequence that anybody remembers, the relative and the absolute. He did not have a whole bunch of students. Little is known of him. We're told that Bodhidharma actually had two students or around here, or Waco had two students. Actually, Bodhidharma had had three students, but only one of them um, went on to have an impact on us, and and that is Waco. And then there was Waco was supposed to have a couple students. One went off to the Netherlands and was hardly ever heard of again, and the other one went off to the city and was hardly ever heard of again. But this guy wrote the relative and the absolute, which is considered a song. It's a poem, but a song of meditation. And there's been two or three great masters that have done this. Hakuin, a Japanese master of the 18th century, wrote a wonderful song about meditation that someday, when I can get my lazy bones moving, we're actually going to put in our chant book <laughs> and figure out how to chant because, it, you know. But... Um, we come down in there, and before we get to the big luminary, let me find my... And this is waning. And waning is important because waning um, had a bunch of very distinct things about him. And I got a date for waning, which is he died in 713, he was born in 638. And there are some things that make Wei Ning unique. One is he was illiterate. If we just take everything at face value, Wei Ning was illiterate, like most people would be at that time. And he went to study at a temple with the fifth patriarch. And um, he has the only sutra that's named after a, a historical person other than the Buddha. And that is the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch and the Sixth Patriarch of Zen in China. So he's the Sixth Chinese Master. But Hui Ning went and saw his master, and the very first encounter, the master didn't want to take him on as a student because he was from the South. Hui Ning goes in and he meets the master, and the master says to him, You're nothing but a barbarian. <laughs> what are you doing here? And he's, he's young. He's quite young at the time. And uh, Wei Ning says, even barbarians have the Buddha nature, don't they? And so the master, kind of feeling maybe that he's being a little bit challenged in front of other people, he sends him off to the kitchen to work. <clears throat> and Wei Ning goes off and he works in a granary where they would use a millstone to, to break the husks off the rice, you know, to, for polished rice. And uh, he's working down there. And when Waning finally has his awakening experience, see, there's a number of things about Waning that are, to me, are, are very, very important. He wasn't a monk. Waning was a young lay person who stood up to the tiger, who challenged the master. He'd already cut his arm off. He left his family, which was his mother. He traveled across traveled for weeks to get to this monastery because he heard a monk reciting, reciting the sutra. Now, come on, think about that. In that time and age, to travel for weeks into a wilderness of strange people that looked at you as a barbarian, that treated you with less than respect, to go to, a, go to a monastery to try to become the student of a master who very well might not even receive you, takes a lot of guts. Or he was insane. But it takes a lot of guts because I can't tell you how many people have called me and wanted to become Zen monks. I don't even write their name down anymore. I wait for at least the third letter or phone call. You know, because there's, there's this inertia. And we've had people come here. I don't know if you remember any of them. They were in and out of here so fast, they thought they would be... We, we don't do that anymore. Jackie and I decided we didn't do that anymore. But they used to come up here and they'd stay two or three days and poof, they were gone. 
And all they would do is come in and rearrange furniture and rearrange things so they were comfortable. And then they, you know, found out, well, this isn't what I wanted. And they go on. So this guy goes all that distance, weeks and weeks and weeks, and comes in and challenges the master and gets sent to the kitchen. He's a layman. He's not a monk. He has no status. He's illiterate. We don't even know how much he knew about Buddhism, but he did have an awakening experience hearing the Diamond Sutra recited. So he probably knew something, and maybe he wasn't as uneducated as he puts himself out to be. But um, he becomes the, he becomes the sixth patriarch, is given the robe and the bowl, which at that time was a mark of, of transmission, and it stopped. It officially stopped as the only way you could be transmitted because the fifth patriarch told him this is the last time the robe and the bowl would be passed on. And so he takes off, with, and he told him to leave in the middle of the night because people are going to be jealous. So he hits the road. <clears throat> and uh, he's caught up with. And uh, the, the head monk challenges him. And Bodhi, and not Bodhidharma, but Waning wins. And then the head monk says, uh, I want to be your student. And he said, no, go back and, and teach. You understand now. And so now we get two schools, the south and the north. Okay, and Waining school is supposed to be the sudden school, and the North is supposed to be the gradual school. And so Waining school, think about it: <clears throat> young wood gatherer, not even a wood cutter, he was a wood gatherer, went out and picked up the little branches that had fallen, brought them back, and sold them. Um, <clears throat> had two enlightenment experiences for sure, and really probably more. But he had great openings, as we say. And the northern school said that enlightenment can only be achieved through long practice over long years. And so we get, almost from the beginning, a division of approach. On one side, the idea that you have to very slowly and methodically cultivate yourself so that you can awaken. And on the other side, the notion that this can happen in the blink of an eye. Now, I always think of the northern school as when they're talking about this slow cultivation, they're talking about uh, formal cultivation. If, if you were an 18-year-old working in, in the granary in a monastery surrounded by approximately, probably around 3,000 monks, because they were big like that back then, 1,000 to 1,500 lay people, how could you not be exposed to everything Buddhist? How could you not be exposed to the words of the Master every day when he went to the Dharma Hall? Because in those days, the Master gave a talk every day. It wasn't real long, but that was part of his job, you know, that cushy job as abbot, is he had to come up with something to talk about every day. You know that everyone in the temple would talk about it. You know that the people that couldn't make it to the lecture hall would have other people relating, oh, you can't believe what he did today. So this monk was down there being cultivating. And, of course, he was doing something that could be intensely boring, right? He's pounding the hulls off of rice. How many weeks can you do that before it gets old? So here is the perfect opportunity for learning to stay awake, for making every moment fresh. You know, monks will chant the same chant every day of their life for their entire life. And monks are taught that the last time you chant the Heart Sutra should be just as new to you as the first time you ever chanted it. And people make the excuse, well, I know it, I've done so many times, I'm tired of it. Okay, but now let's put down everything and start over again, every moment. And if you chant that thing for the first time, every time you chant it, how could you be bored? You know, if you walk outside, I mean, you ever heard anybody say, I have, but I just wondered if you had. They walked outside, and like our view here, which everybody always thinks is wonderful, and I do too, that's why we're here. But they walk outside, they look around, and they, they get bored. 
Sure. Uh, because they're not getting stimulated. They're not seeing new stuff. I walk outside and I'm just amazed every day. <laughs> but there's, there's so much change in here too. But there's never going to be two sunsets or two winter days or two anything that are the same. But they're so marvelous. Well, it's the same thing with chanting. I mean, I've, I've trained monks that were bored with a chant before they learned it. Couldn't really do it on their own, but now they were bored with it because they wanted something new. Well, if you get bored easily, meditation is not the best activity in the world for you. And, uh, you know, there was this great cartoon years ago where a young monk sitting next to an old monk and his eyes are the size of saucers and he says to the old monk, what do you mean this is all there is? <laughs> and, but it really is, this is all there is. So, uh, six patriarch, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about him next time and we'll, we'll uh, look. But what did the six patriarch give us? You know, how can we define him? Because I'm doing this on the board, I've run out of space. But what can we say he gave us? Well, Bodhidharma, when he came, and he was asked as he was getting old and he was leaving, he said, what did, what did you bring? What did you bring from India that was different? And he said, I brought you a transmission outside the written word. Outside the sutras. And his transmission was the mind-to-mind transmission. Because the mind is where every takes, everything takes place. By that time, China had a lot of sutras. They had a lot of Buddhist stuff. There were things they didn't have, and the Chinese, believe it or not, sat down and wrote their own version of it until they got it. So they had a lot of written stuff. They had an inclination towards the academic. As I was talking, I started to talk about the day, I didn't go off on that, but the notion of wisdom. Wisdom has nothing to do with education, and it has nothing to do with what family you were born in, and it has nothing to do with how old you are. I know perfectly silly people that are 80 years old, you know, that have not learned a single thing living their whole life. They still do the same dumb stuff, and they still have the same dumb prejudices, and they'll still tell you why that person, you don't want to have anything to do with them because they don't believe like they believe and all those things. There's no wisdom there. So wisdom is not age-specific. It probably doesn't hurt to have a little experience, but it isn't going to automatically come. Now, our old idea that age wisdom came with age had to do with if you lived in a village and you were 60 years old and everybody else was 40 years old, you'd probably figured out how to survive. You know, you knew when to climb the tree and when to, when to hide under the stack and to do those things, and that is a very practical kind of wisdom. But you still may be very, very superstitious. But the wisdom we talk about here is the wisdom of knowing true nature. And so here's a young guy, very unassuming guy, that's open at the right time to hear the words of a sutra, and it just goes right to his heart. It's a flash of lightning for him. And then he goes back to the monastery and he starts talking to the master. And the master immediately sees this. But he didn't become a monk until, I think it was five years, four or five years after he was enlightened. And, of course, the practical reason is so he could teach. Who's going to listen to this country bumpkin that has been wandering around in the woods? 